important issue of our time. Today marks the second anniversary of the passage of Obamacare. Despite the fact that most Americans opposed it, Obamacare has been thrust upon the citizens of our country in one massive power grab. Indeed, Obamacare threatens our economy, quality and cost of health care, and our most basic liberties. Thus, Independence Hall Tea Party Association is holding this tri-state repeal Obamacare press conference to remind the President, the Congress, state legislators, the media, and the public at large that nearly two out of every three Americans now oppose the enactment of this law. The association was joined, uh, I'm sorry. as time passes, the number of Obamacare opponents keeps growing. Perhaps it's due to the fact that the Congressional Budget Office now puts the cost of Ob Obamacare at nearly $2 trillion, more than double its original estimate of less than a trillion dollars. The association has steadfastly opposed Obamacare over the past three years sending buses to D.C. and Harrisburg to voice objection to it, and rallying in support of legislation such as Pennsylvania State Representative Matt Baker's HB 42, allowing Pennsylvania to opt out of Obamacare, and the repeal Obamacare pa bill passed last year by the U.S. House of Representatives. We object to Obamacare on so many levels, whether it be the individual mandate, the inevitable rationing of health care, the loss of personal choice in deciding health plans and doctors, or the skyrocketing cost. We will not rest until the legislation is repealed, even if that requires electing a new U.S. President and U.S. Senate. Thank you very much. There's been just a little bit of a schedule change. The first person we're going to hear from is Congressman Mike Fitzpatrick. He's the Congressional Representative for Pennsylvania's 8th District. Thank you, Terry. Uh, good morning. As, uh, as Terry said, this is, uh, I call this an anniversary, the two-year anniversary of the President's, uh, President Obama's health care takeover of our country. It's uh, frankly, it's an anniversary that not much of us, uh, not many of us are celebrating. And so I know that many of you uh, probably were in the nation's capital in March of 2010 at the time that the bill was passed. And of course that bill was passed over the objections of many without much debate, certainly with very few town hall meetings, including my home of Bucks County, no town hall meetings on the bill. And as then Speaker Nancy Pelosi famously said, we have to build, pass the bill first before we read it in order to find out what's in it. So here we are two years later. The bill was unpopular in March of 2010. And with my constituents, it is even more unpopular today. There were several promises that the president made. Those promises uh, were specific. Those promises uh, were personal uh, and individual to all of us. The president said that if the health care bill passed, the bill that uh, is referred to as the Affordable Care Act was passed, the jobs would be created. He said that our health care premiums would uh, not go up, that our health care premiums would go down. The president also said that if you have a health care plan that you like, or a doctor that you like, you can keep them. He said that jobs would be created. They weren't. He said that our health care premiums would go down, and they haven't. He said that if we had a plan that we liked, or a doctor we liked, we could keep it, and we can. So essentially the promises, all the promises, the individual promises and the personal promises he made to us have come to pass and not be true. One of the other things that the President said, and Nancy Pelosi said, is that this bill would be fully paid for. That the $900 billion cost uh, would be offset. We now know what those offsets were, about $575 billion stolen from the Medicare program. Taxes in the health care bill on income, on dividends, on medical devices. 
with only six years of benefits. And those are the kind of budget gimmicks that have been going on for too long in Washington. And so that $900 billion cost that was inferred back in March of 2010, we now know by the Congressional Budget Office's own estimates, was seriously underestimated. And the real cost over 10 years is not $900 billion, but is about $1.7 trillion. So all of the promises have come to be not true. The cost was underestimated by about 100%. And very few of my constituents tell me that they've actually benefited from the law, even peripherally. As a matter of fact, the businesses that I talk to in Bucks County, in the 8th Congressional District, almost to a company, will tell you that their health care premiums have not just gone up, but they've gone up appreciably. And I, I met about 10 days ago at one particular business in Bucks County. They employ about 80 individuals from my district. Their health care premiums this year increased 46 percent and so clearly this is a bill that has not lived up to its promises is more unpopular today than it was when it was passed two years ago and is now headed for its final fate before the united states supreme court and i'm one of the members of congress uh, that signed my name to a brief pending before the supreme court on the uh, unconstitutionality of the individual mandate. The individual mandate is, I believe, um, unconstitutional. And because the bill was passed without much debate, without reading it, a 2,000 page behemoth bill, uh, unprecedented takeover of one sixth of our economy, it was done so quickly that the legislators actually forgot to put a severability clause in the law. And so the point of the brief that I filed is that if the individual mandate is found unconstitutional, which I believe it should be, then the whole bill must fall because there's no severability clause in the president's health care bill. And so if we gather here two years later, um, this is not a situation where we can celebrate because we were right. You were right. Everything that you said two years ago has come to pass. But I think what we need to do is you know, make certain that this bill is found unconstitutional, um, that the House of Representatives where I serve continues to pass legislation um, to repeal the bill, repeal it in full and defund it, which I voted for. But it's not enough in life and it's not enough in the nation's capital to just be against something. You also have to be for something. And I have very proudly supported health care reform that is free market based including association health plans to permit small businesses to band together so that they have the same bargaining position as larger businesses and have that same leverage when they go to the table with insurance companies. Health care reform that will permit individuals to purchase their health care across state lines. Currently federal law does not permit you to do that and I think that federal law needs to be changed. The type of laws that will put health care back in the hands of the individuals. It's your life, it's your health. The choice as to where you get your health care should be yours and not the federal government's. And finally, we passed a bill yesterday um, enacting medical liability reform in the House of Representatives uh, toward reform for physicians. There's a recent study that says about one in every four tests ordered by a physician are unnecessary and are ordered simply because of the threat of frivolous lawsuits against them. And those are tests and those are expenses that we all pay for. And these are solutions that make sense that are right before us that we can enact now. So as I said, it's not enough just to be against something. You have to be for something. And I'm very proud to support and be for free market health care principles, such as the bills that were passed in the House of Representatives yesterday. So thanks for inviting me to be part of this rally. Um, keep up the good work, and I'm sure we'll see many of you in the nation's capital this week. Thank you. Okay, now the next person we're going to hear from is Anna Little. She's a former Monmouth freeholder and mayor. She was mayor of Highlands, New Jersey. She's a current congressional candidate for the New Jersey 6th District. I'm going to come out in front of the podium a little bit because I'm very short. 
I want you to understand that this is your opportunity in 2012 to take back your government and to repeal Obamacare. This is all about what we as citizens can do. Obamacare is the biggest assault on the U.S. Constitution that I've seen in my lifetime, and it may be the biggest assault on the U.S. Constitution ever. We've got to stand up now, and we've got to exercise our constitutional right to elect representatives who will bring our voice to Washington. And by that action, we can affect the repeal of this law. You know, in 2010, you took back the House of Representatives. There have been jobs bills, 20 or more, passed to create private sector jobs in the House of Representatives since you elected a majority to that House. They are doing what you tell them to do. You must take back the U.S. Senate this year and you must take back the presidency and that's how we will repeal Obamacare fully because we've passed the law from the House of Representatives to do so. We need the Senate to consider it and to sign on. And we need the president to execute that law. I'm very serious about this. In New Jersey, we have a congressman named Frank Pallone who has indicated that it was not Nancy Pelosi's bill, it was not Harry Reid's bill, it was his bill. And that it was a good bill and he was going to vote for it even though thousands of his constituents said, no, we don't want it, do as you're told, do not sign this bill, do not vote for this bill. He did it anyway. We came very close in 2010, we're going after him again in 2012, and we encourage all of you to make your voices heard relative to this bad law which must be repealed. We need to support good law, like what Congressman Fitzpatrick has described to you today. We need to give him and the other conservative leaders in the House of Representatives the cover they need to go forward with your agenda, the people's agenda, with health care reform that promotes job creation, freedom, and that will not result, dare I say it, in the rationing of care that we the people predict will occur in order to create the savings that this president has promised. We cannot allow anyone to get between us and our families. We must allow patients and doctors to determine what kind of medical care is necessary to cure illness, to create quality of life, and what kind of medical treatment a patient will decide to follow. We must protect this very fundamental freedom. Without proper access and the freedom to choose our medical care, we cannot have that right to life, that right to quality of life that is protected.